right now. I mean, what what is the TPP, and it, is it good for the U.S. and the world? Well, the TPP is simply the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Deal, and I'm kind of leery of these trade deals, certainly after what we've witnessed with NAFTA, and then even more importantly, what we've witnessed with China since they became the most favorable nation status going back uh, roughly 20 years ago. But the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Deal would set new terms for trade and business investment among the United States and about 11 other Pacific Rim nations with a gross domestic product uh, of nearly $28 trillion. That, Dave, would represent roughly about 40% of global GDP and about one-third of world trade. It will further encourage export of manufacturing jobs, as you know, to low-wage nations while limiting and encouraging competition for pharmaceuticals and other high-value products by spreading American standards for patent protection to other countries. That's what it's about. Now, is, is, do, you, do you believe that this is going to be good for the people here in the U.S. and the world, or is this something that the government's trying to pass for themselves and maybe corporations, banks, and whatnot? Well, I think we continue to see industry, as I'm sure you'll agree, continue to seek out the cheapest worldwide labor. So I think this is really about labor costs and containing them and certainly keeping them from rising. I think you've got to put in perspective, which very few people realize, which I'm sure you know, a garment worker in China earns about 86 cents an hour. In Cambodia, a worker earns just 22 cents per hour. There are no minimum wage laws in a lot of these foreign countries. We've now created the work in poor, uh, six unemployed Americans for every job opening. It's a disaster. So you're saying that the jobs, I mean, they, they promise us NAFTA and all the other trade agreements that this is going to create jobs here in the it U.S. It didn't do it. No, we're seeing that it, it did not do this whatsoever. And they're telling us that the, this new trade agreement is going to create jobs, create manufacturing do you think the, it's it's going to be the same exact thing? They're just feeding us a line that this is going to help well, us? Well, I think we're being fed a lie. I think all, all these trade agreements, as I'm sure you'll concur, look fine on a piece of paper, but in actuality they don't work. I think when we talk about the bigger picture, which I know you're involved in the bigger picture with what you do with your website, there's five things that will not change in our economy. Number one, I believe war will continue, but, but will not either be won or lost. Number two, both debt and currency creation will continue to rise. Number three, gold, silver, crude oil, and food prices will also continue to rise. Number four, the number of Americans on food stamps will also continue to rise. And fifthly and lastly, Americans working full-time jobs will also continue to decline. Those are the five things that I believe will not change in our economy as we move forward, Dave. Okay. Now, talking about the economy, let's just change subjects sure. here for a sec. I mean, the United States government continually tells us and the Fed continually tells us that we're in this recovery period. And we know what happened prior to 2008, leading up to 2008. And they're continually telling us that retail is fine, real estate is fine. Do you see real estate as being okay right now? Give us a, a small breakdown of what's going on in real estate. Well, I think, first of all, home ownership is, again, uh, I'm sure you know, is at the lowest level in 20 years. I think home prices, quite frankly, are still too high and wages are still too low. Seven out of eight jobs we've created in the last five years have been part-time employment positions. We got 53% of all Americans now earning less than $30,000 a year. The poverty rate is over 16%. The level's now higher than it was uh, when we declared the war on poverty back in 1965. And we now have approximately 50 million Americans living on food stamps. So I think when we talk about the big picture, and certainly housing is part of the big picture, I, I still believe even though we've had a fall in, in home prices, these homes are basically still overvalued. As you know, Dave, home prices going back in the old days used to go up 3, 4, 5% a year, the rate of inflation. Right. We witnessed in the last cycle home prices going up 20% a year annually compounded for five years. It was unsustainable. It had to bust out. 
and I don't think we've really seen the selling uh, come into the market, and I think, quite frankly, that's still ahead of us. So do you see a repeat of 2008? I mean, do you see the American people supporting this housing market at this time? Well, I think when we look at wages, and they've been flat adjusted for inflation going all the way back to 1965, we're not creating the decent paying jobs. It's still, quite frankly, cheaper to rent than own. And I think when you look at mortgage rates, true, they're at historic all-time lows. But when you look at how much you're, you're borrowing to buy the home, you're still paying more than I think intrinsically the home is, is truly worth. So I think we do have a fall in housing prices ahead of us. I think it will be dramatic. I was a contractor for FDIC and Resolution Trust in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Naturally, we were talking about the scenario involving commercial real estate. But I can tell you, when a lot of those assets came to the auction block, uh, they brought very little money. So I think when these homes actually you know, hit the auction block, I think the surprise for a lot of people is, is for how little they, they sell at the end of the day. Now, the, the Fed keeps talking about raising interest rates. True. And they're continually telling us they're going to do it, they're going to do it. Um, do you think they will do it, and do you think they can do it? And well, I think when you look we'll at have... the commitment of all the central banks of the world, as you know, we've pumped unprecedented liquidity into all these markets. The printing presses have been running now for seven, eight years. I think when you look at the leverage, and that's a key point that a lot of people are, are overlooking, Dave, as well, we've got unprecedented leverage in all these markets. Honestly, it wouldn't take much of a move by the Fed with interest rates to, to topple the Tower of Babel, in my belief. So I think it, it, it's PR. I think they'll talk about raising interest rates, but I think at the end of the day, they're going to be unable to. Yeah, because if they do, uh, the stock market, the bond market, the real estate market, I, I don't know if all of these areas can take a rise in interest rates. I mean, what do you think? You think it would have a well, I think when effect? you talk about the equity market, certainly the stock and bond markets, you've got more leverage employed in these markets than ever before. You know, you go back and you look at a similar period, and the only similar period in, in, in my career that I can certainly relate to historically, we'd have to go back to the bull market of the 20s when we were utilizing roughly margin and at, at 10 to 1 leverage. We had 10% margin. You've got people in here using all kinds of financial devices and, and utilizing leverage 100 to 1 and maybe even more than that. So we really don't need that much of a move in these markets to start to snowball down the hill. I think you've got to use whatever strength we get in these markets moving forward to lighten up, take some money off the table. I think the upside in the equity markets are very limited, and I think the downside is very great. And when you look at where this bull market began, as you know, in March of 2009, we've had a run from Dow 64.70 and the S&P right around 6.70. So I think if you can take money off the table and if you're not ready to get out of the market at these levels, at least employ some close stops and, and raise some cash because I think when this market starts down, it's going to be a very sudden and dramatic drop. It's going to catch most investors totally unaware. So where does gold fit into all this? I mean, we see gold, it's around, what, eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 an ounce right now. Has yes, it, it really is. hasn't really moved that much. Um, actually, it, it was hitting highs of like 18, 19, and then it's come down. Uh, first, do you think there is gold suppression? And why is gold still so low? Well, I think we've had suppression in all the markets. I no longer believe we have markets. We have interventions. And... When you talk about the ability of, of manipulation and or intervention in the markets, you can go all the way back to 1980 when a piece of legislation was passed under the presidency of Ronald Reagan, which is an executive order which is still on the books. It's called the Monetary Control Act of 1980, and what it basically says is the government can intervene in any market at any time for any reason. So we have had intervention in these markets uh, going all the way back uh, to 1980. 
certainly we didn't have intervention in 1980 to the degree we have today, but, you know, there is a precedent for this intervention having gone on for a long, long time. So do you see gold going back up? I mean, a lot of people are saying that gold is going to go down to $800 an ounce. Do you see gold going down or up at this point? I see gold going up. I still think we're in the very early stages of a historic bull market in the precious metals. This is only the sixth time in 200 years that we've witnessed a super cycle commodity bull market. I'd like to name quickly for your listening audience the other prior periods when we've had these super cycle commodity bulls. The first one would have been the War of 1812, second one would have been the Civil War, third one would have been World War I, fourth one would have been World War II in Korea, the fifth one would have been the Cold War, and now the sixth time in history, the ongoing war on terror. So I think when we talk about commodity bulls, as you know, Dave, they last typically around 18 to 20 years. And the biggest gains in a commodity bull are not in the first half, they're in the second. Having said that, when we talk about gold, you know, we started the bull market in 1999. We retested it again in 2001 at 255 an ounce in gold and silver at less than $4 an ounce. We've had a move uh, in gold from 255 to $1,930 and then a move in silver from less than $4 to 4945 And we've had a very long, drawn-out, pronounced correction. But I think when we look at the context of the correction, it falls in line with the previous commodity bull we had in the 1970s when we had roughly a 47% 40 40 correction in the price of gold. We had gold move from 103 to 206 and then correct back down, I believe, to $99. From that point, we saw gold rally eight times, over eight times. So. I am of the belief here that we've seen the lows right around 1140, a full 50% correction of the entire bull move from 255 to 1930 comes in at 1080, Dave. Mm -hmm. We're not that far from 1080. Worst case scenario, maybe 1,000, but I don't think we see it. But the point being, if we have seen the reactionary lows on this move and 1140 turns out to be the low, which, again, I tend to believe it will be, we got the potential to go up eight times. You know, we went roughly from the 102 level in 1975 to 850 in 1980-81. So if 1140 turns out to be the bottom and we get an eight-fold increase off the reactionary low, we're looking at a potential in gold of 9120. Wow. Okay. I think so, it's a very good possibility. Yeah. And I think we're looking for a move in silver very easily over $100 an ounce. And when, let me ask you, I mean, when do you think this will occur? Do you have any, like, time frame from your calculations? Well, I think when you talk about seasonality in the metals, which I'm sure you're aware of, we have up months of January, February, April, May, July, September, November, and December. And we typically have down months in March, June, October, August, and October. So I think the summer months may be somewhat uh, disappointing, but I think as we get into the fall and the later part of the year, seasonality-wise, these are strong times for the precious metals. And I think once we get gold back above the 200-day moving average, I think it's going to signal that the bear market is over and we're into a new leg of a, of a bull move in the precious metals. Uh, I think that will be quite dramatic. Okay. Now, now we understand, I mean, this was in part of our talking points, but I just wanted to bring this up with, we sure. see, Joe, we see what's going on with Greece right now, yes. and we see that they they really have no money left. I mean, they're, they're no. kind of broke, <laughs> and <laughs> they, they skipped a payment, and we were talking uh, about black swans, and Yes. I wanted to know, do you think this is going to be some type of black swan, or if not, what other black swans do you see? Well, I think with Greece, and I couldn't agree with you more, they're broke, and I think the situation is now coming to a head, and we've got a potential bankruptcy of Greece on July 20th, 2015. I think Germany, quite honestly, is going to re uh, refuse to fund Greece any further. But as I've said many times, Greece is the first domino to fall in the European Union. You know, I think Greece will certainly go down, and I think when it does, 
it's going to take Portugal, Spain, and Italy shortly behind it. So I think Greece, to answer your question, is the first black swan, and I think it's a real one, and I think it's one we certainly have to be aware of. I think the second scenario could be the Chinese equity markets. They experience a sudden and dramatic drop in prices. As you know, they've had a huge run, and we could get a panic shift back into gold by the Chinese consumers. I think the third black swan, again, and we've talked about it briefly, is the overvaluation in the U.S. equity markets. Uh, there's no fear in the market. People think it can continue to go higher. And I think the three immediate concerns when we talk about the equity markets in the U.S. are, one, they're extremely overvalued. Number two, they're widely uh, overextended. Number three, they're, they're rampantly euphoric. But I think the fourth black swan out there could be the various Asian equity markets all experience a very sharp sell-off uh, as fears of an Asian slowdown in their respective uh, economies takes hold. I think people remember certainly what took place in the Japanese uh, market going back in the mid-1980s and, and, and early 1990s. And as you know, Japan, Dave, has been in a deflationary downturn for over 25 years with no end in sight even though they've had continued massive and unprecedented stimulus measures by the, by the Bank of Japan. And then I think the fifth black swan could be the various international global equity markets all beginning a very erratic and volatile trading pattern with huge swings in equity prices both up and down with the potential fear of another Lehman Brothers credit-related event happening unexpectedly in the market. So these are the black swans that I think are out there. You know, which one will be the trigger to start the market down? Who knows? Right. I mean, now, Joe, let me ask you. I mean, you're talking about all these black swans, all these things that could okay. just knock the economy on its feet. I mean, do you see Essentially. Do you see a collapse type of scenario, or do you see this economy dragging out like Japan? Well, I've said many times, no one will walk away from this collapse, and I believe that. I, I think what has gone on has gone on so long that there's not going to be any orderly way out of this. I think, honestly, one day these, these markets start down and a panic sets in and everybody tries to get out at the same time, and I think the reality and the wake-up call is going to be, who do you sell to? Right. So, when... I mean, do you have a, a time frame from all your analysis where you think something's going to occur? Well, I think if we want to put it uh, in a time frame, I would say the next 6 to 18 months maximum, I think we're definitely going to see the rubber reach the road here. This cannot continue. This mass of unprecedented money pumping into the system has got to come to an end. You know, the dollar is now under attack. The petrodollar is under attack. We've got China, India, Russia now now conducting trade and commerce uh, in, 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 in something other than the dollar. You know, I was recently asked, you know, how much gold do you think China is truly holding? And mm -hmm. I've got to tell you, I think they're holding much more than anyone would realize. In fact, I'll even go on the record and state I think they're holding more than the U.S. gold reserves. You know, China announces its gold reserves, as I'm sure you know, every several years. And the last time they announced their gold reserves, they, they admitted to about 1,100 tons. The U.S. Uh, purports to hold about 8,100 tons. But I believe over the last several years, China's probably accumulated somewhere around 20, 25,000 tons of gold, Dave. I believe that. If that is the case, and I have no reason based on my research to, to, to doubt it, at 20, 25,000 tons, they would be holding three times the gold reserves of the Federal Reserve. I think when that announcement is made, and maybe it's not 20, 25,000 tons, maybe it's 15, 16, 18,000 tons, it's going to shock the market and it's going to bring on the collapse that I think everyone's been waiting for. So but two, two things I wanted to ask you, Joe. Do, sure. you, do you think the Fed actually has gold? That's well, I think they actually have gold. I think the question is how much. You know, the last time we've had an auditing of the Fed's gold reserves, it took place, as you know, during the Korean War in 1953. So I don't think there's any way accurately to know how much gold we're holding at this point. Hopefully we're holding more than you and I would want to believe, hopefully. 
But from them stopping an audit today, it, it makes everyone believe that they don't have as much as they say. Because if they did, what would be a problem of going in and auditing the gold? Well, I think the other thing which is very, very telling to me is uh, when these foreign nations have requested repatriation of the gold, it's been refused. Yes, and that's another You know, you go back and you look at what happened with Venezuela, with Hugo Chavez, just prior to him becoming very ill, when he requested repatriation of his gold. You know, they were the only nation to get back their total gold reserves because they asked for them very early. But they set in motion a pattern for other nations to request their gold reserves, and so far they've received just a fraction of the gold reserves they've had on deposit, Germany being primarily one of the ones. Let me, let me ask you this. You mentioned China. You mentioned their gold reserve. Okay. Why do you think China is accumulating so much gold at this point? Well, they're holding, as you know, huge dollar-denominated reserves. They're holding roughly $4 trillion in, in dollar-denominated assets, and they want to move away from the dollar. They know it's losing value. They know its days of a world reserve currency are very limited, and they eventually want to back their currency, the yuan, with gold. And I think that's inevitable, and I think it will happen. The question is the timing of that. But... When you take a look at what's going on with the petrodollar now, we have countries that are selling oil for gold, countries buying oil for gold, and they're bypassing the U.S. dollar. So I think when we look at what is going on globally in all the markets, I've said many times in the newsletter, the economic sands of the world are shifting under our feet, yet very few people realize it. This is a very, very different time than anything we've ever seen in history. No, it is. It, it definitely is. Now, we understand that in China, the yuan, renminbi, uh, they're looking to get that uh, in the basket of the SDRs for yes, they a, are. A, as a reserve currency. And we know, I think it comes up this fall uh, where the IMF is going to look at this. And we see the United States, they really don't want this to occur. No, they, they don't. They don't. And they're, they're going to try to stop this and most likely do whatever they possibly can to make it not happen. But well, the, I think when you take a look at the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank and you mm -hmm. take a look at the regional members of the bank and you take a look at the members that have signed on to the bank that you never would have believed uh, would become part of it. You know, you've got Bangladesh, Brunei, Cambodia, China, Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Kuwait, Laos, Malaysia. Mongolia, Miramar, Nepal, Oman, Pakistan, the Philippines, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, South Korea, Sri Lanka, Tajikistan, Thailand, Turkey, Uzbekistan, and Vietnam. And then you have the non-regional members, Austria, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, New Zealand, Switzerland, the United Kingdom. So... This is here to stay. China is funded it initially with about $500 billion. They're going to lend money to countries to improve and build their infrastructure. This is a way of the future, Dave. Right. You're not going to turn this back. So if this goes forward with China having all this gold, most yes. likely maybe backing their currency with gold, what happens to the dollar? Well, again, I think you've got to go back to when the dollar became a world reserve currency, as you know, at the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944. We were basically on the gold standard for 27 years, 1944 to 1971. We've now been off the gold standard 44 years. So we've been off the gold standard certainly far more than we were when we were on it. And I think when you take a look at what has happened with this tremendous amount of, of debt and this tremendous amount of buildup of, of, of dollars uh, that, that are globally awash all over the world, you know, it is time for a country to back their currency once again by gold, and I truly believe that it will be China. You know, Russia is holding a tremendous amount of gold as well, but people fail to realize China is not only the largest gold consumer in the world, they're the largest gold producer. Mm. And I think that speaks volumes as to the importance of gold, certainly in their culture and more importantly in their economy. So do you think China's going to set the price of gold once they come out with, okay, we have this much gold and we know they, they have the uh, Shanghai Exchange? Yes, they do. 
And do you think they're going to actually say, okay, this is the real price of gold? Well, I think when you look at the paper markets, the paper markets, as I'm sure you'll agree, do not reflect the physical price of gold, nor do they uh, reflect certainly the supply. There's very little physical gold and silver in the marketplace for sale, and I know people don't want to believe that, but it's true. As you know, the mints have been on back order for the most popular coins. The demand for the silver coins have been tremendous. They've set all-time records. And I think when you take a look at what is going on, you know, with the, with the bigger picture, and we come back to the bigger picture, where we've got countries now selling a strategic commodity such as oil for gold. What does that say? It says we're moving away from the dollar and we're moving away from it rapidly. And I think at some point we're going to get a, a repricing in all asset classes and they're going to be repriced and it's going to be very painful if you're exposed to dollar-denominated assets. That's ahead of us. Joe, do you think that um, we're going to see inflation or deflation. I mean, there's camps right now. What, what do you think is going to I think happen? we see both. I think we see runaway inflation. You know, when you go back and you look at what happened to Germany after World War I, and I'm not saying we go down that road because I just don't think that's inevitable, but I think we get hyperinflation first, then a collapse, and then we get a very brutal deflation, take many, many years to play out. That's the way I see it, Dave. Okay, so this is going to make it very tough for everyone living here in the U.S. Um, well, I think you've got to have a plan. I think you've got to be able to deal with the resetment of asset prices. And I think when you take a look at collectibles and you take a look at hard assets, and I recently wrote in an issue of the newsletter, Gold's performance for versus other global asset classes over the last decade, namely global real estate and modern art. And gold has appreciated 179% over the last 10 years. Real estate in London's appreciated 138% over the last 10 years. New York prime real estate's appreciated 67% in a 10-year period. And Martin Art has appreciated about 258% as per the Knight Frank Luxury Index. So we are seeing people move away from the dollar. We are seeing people try to lock up the storage of wealth, the storage of value. This dollar just continues to lose too much, too much purchasing power, and I don't see any end in sight to that. You know, if you go back and, and you look at a 1913 dollar, it's worth about five cents. Right, so the dollar is losing value, gold is going up in value, art's going up in value, real estate yes, right is. now is going up in value. Why would people hold on to the dollar? It makes no sense at this point. I mean, Well, you know, the other point, people are in love with equities, and to touch upon quickly what I think is the potential for these markets, you know, in 1929, when the Dow hit 381 and we had the collapse and, and we had the bottom uh, in equity prices, which were 41 in the Dow in 1933, it took a period of 25 years from 1929 to 1954 to get back above 381 in the Dow. So what I'm saying, Dave, is when this top is finally put in place in these equity markets, and whether it comes in at 19 or 20,000, I, I think is irrelevant. The point simply is I think we're looking at a quarter of a century and or a generation to get back above these levels once, once we start back down. Now, let me ask you, are there any signals people can look at to show that the economy is starting to fall apart? Um, well, I think when we look at retail sales, I don't think we can trust the numbers. I think when we look at the labor partition, uh, participation rate, We've got a labor participation rate now right around the levels we had in the mid-1970s. I think when you take it, the, the ability of people to find decent paying jobs and, and quality employment, the job market has never been tougher. We've got more people now that are out of the workforce than are actually working. So I think the signs are there if you want to recognize them and you want to be aware that the economy is still deteriorating. The economic recovery, I believe, has been an illusion. It's not helped working class America. It's not done anything for the guy in the street. True, it, it has certainly helped the stock and bond markets, and a lot of money has been made there. But, you know, these markets went up, I believe, for all the wrong reasons 